Yeah, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Bavani. Really looking forward to my next special guest, Shayan Eskandari. He is a security expert and a yeah, Bitcoiner. And uh, we've been planning to do this talk for a while now. And I want to, you know, dig a little bit also uh, concerning COVID-19 or coronavirus uh, uh, in connection with Iran. And, you know, internationally, he lives in Canada. So we're, we're going to talk a spectrum of topics, but of course, in focus on Bitcoin, the whole macroeconomical situation, how we can get out of this mess as smoothly as possible. And really looking forward, really curious about his perspectives and thoughts. So yeah, without further ado, this is my talk with Shayana Skandari. And let me know if you have any questions. My email address is hello at the totalconnector.com. Make sure you follow me on Twitter and any other social media like subscribe share follow me whatever you do thanks so much for your support and for listening all right all right welcome to the total bitcoin podcast show shayan Eskandari. we've been waiting <laughs> i think to do this interview for such a long time i'm really happy to yeah you. <laughs> thank you for having me well thank you for your time man how are you doing man good good working from home all the time so not that much different yeah <laughs> can i ask you like what what city are you from originally from because i'm you know we're both from iran uh, where are you from can, yeah. can you tell me a little bit about yeah your i'm from tehran um yeah i'm from tehran i've been going back and forth between canada and iran since i was in high school uh first with family then not just myself uh but now i'm based in montreal okay so you is your family like uh also like mine like a total diaspora all over the world like yeah america yeah, exactly. and states and everywhere okay yeah, yeah. exactly <laughs> so anyway so um okay we want to talk about bitcoin of course but i want to talk about uh, this whole uh covid19 or sars covid i don't know what i don't know what to call mm -hmm. it because it's such a <laughs> Because uh, I think it's not the first time uh, the the cover up because there's more and more evidence coming out that uh, it's not the first time China has uh, suppressed, covered up, and you know, uh, or now even probably at least negligent, negligently killed you know doctors or you know um, by by you know by by suppressing all this information because there was this incident when with SARS. Uh, I don't know how many years ago they did the same thing, you know, cover up suppression. So uh, I heard in Iran there's this guy, uh, what's his name on Twitter? Um, Ali Yested, Ali is his name. He he tweets mm -hmm. like every day, you know. He 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 gives us like a real beautiful update on the cases, who's dying, you know, the the pain and the suffering, and uh, and he 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 emphasizes he's not a journalist, he's not a doctor, but these are like real authentic testimonials and reports coming in from real people. And if it's, and the numbers are like between somewhere 1300 and 3000 dead people already. Do you know anything about like, what's the situation? Uh, yeah, uh, we actually had like a recording yesterday on some other, on, on my own podcast that uh, people from Rash, Mashhad and Tehran joined in. And it was interesting that um, like, in north of Iran, the situation is even worse, maybe because people traveled there um, and they actually lost some close relatives. But um, everyone's like you're trying to be in lockdown. A lot of people are not considering anything like that, either because of religious reasons or some other reasons. They're not really like staying home. They're just like going around, turning the virus around. And I feel like one of the reasons the Iran situation is like worse than a lot of others, same as Italy, was that they didn't know that the virus existed because China suppressed the news and the yeah. virus was like being spread there without anyone's knowledge. Yeah. And they caught them of the surprise. Yeah. You know what I heard is that uh, because uh, they had already suppressed it, I don't know, uh, I think they had the first indications or evidence in. December, January, maybe let's say, let's say even February. It doesn't matter, but uh, I think there was a lot of uh, I don't know what to call like events taking place in Iran, like with scholars. Not sure whether they were scientists or scholars. It doesn't matter, but it was like people yeah. from China, amongst other nations, coming to Iran, and and then you know, and then this exponential buildup uh, of of the infection rate. You know the. Um, it got really, really bad. So I think that's why Iran was hit really bad um, because of the congregations, you know, of the people yeah. coming together and they didn't yeah, know exactly. at that time, you know. 
It's interesting that like the similar thing has happened in ETCC, one of the Ethereum events that people gathered there. And after that, I think one of the CEOs tweeted that I got, I got positive for COVID-19. And from there, I think near 20 people from that conference had the positive results and a lot of other got sick. Oh. So like similar to that, like just not knowing that this is out there was the worst. Yeah. Wow. It's really sad. Um, so, so, you know, I mean, Iran has already been under sanctions and uh, you know, uh, what else? Embargoes, sanctions uh, for such a long time. Uh, I mean, do you hear like stories? I mean, has it become really exponentially worse, uh, you know, because of the lack of supplies and, you know, medical equipment, medical uh, drugs and whatever? Yeah, like one thing, uh, like my parents are now in Tehran and I talk to them. And one thing that Iranians are really good at is like try to make it make a good situation out of any situation. <laughs> like, first of all, like the jokes that are out there are like the best, um, which in West culture that might consider like desensitive, insensitive. But what can you do? It's like you can't be sad, you can't make, make jokes. And the other thing, like they, Start. I know there is like a lot of clips going on that like some na natural ways of like using even rose water to clean up, which doesn't oh make my, any sense. Yeah, yeah. But there are some ways like um like maybe do like oregano vapor like some natural ways to like clean up your body. Like the, mm -hmm. people use that and people have that in the culture, so that's like, really good to have there. Consider compared to like the Western that toilet paper is the only thing that people <laughs> are trying to like buy. Oh. Um, <laughs> Like it's an interesting difference you see that like people most like the previous generation because of seeing the war, seeing the drought, seeing the sanctions, they are ready to like make the best out of every situation. But sanctions don't help like just have, not having services, internet, internet filtering. Like just imagine if YouTube is open now in Iran, um, people can stay home and watch a lot of things on YouTube. Um, like Opera, which is the Iranian version, doesn't have that much content. A lot of them has been ported to Apparat by like people, <laughs> mm -hmm. but just imagine like if something like YouTube, a lot of other platforms that people use here were just open in Iran, like people can sit home and enjoy their time rather than trying to bypass filters, VPNs, Chinese firewalls and other things. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I've, I've had some talks with, um, uh, you know, these guys who do open source technology. Um, um, how, how, I mean, how creative are, are the Iranians like circumventing all these, you know, bans and restrictions and, you know, control? Um, do, do you know anything about it? Like, how creative are they? Um, I mean, it really depends on what category you're talking about. Like, one of the reasons um, there's a more, more and more people getting into blockchain and Bitcoin is just the censorship resistance but but also censorship resistance is like limited because we don't consider infrastructure as we've seen like when internet was down in iran basically there was everything was censored because yeah. there's no internet mm -hmm. um there are some satellite dish like other methods but uh, people are getting getting creative on um let's say writing putting more clips out there um like coin iran is one of the examples that people are really active in there just putting, um, like translating everything on blockchain, Bitcoin related, it mostly focuses on any blockchain technology and means uh, translating and putting it there. There's a lot of discussions happening, which is basically the only thing they can do. Or some other things like, let's say, Signal, the chatting app, mm -hmm. um, because the initial seed is hosted by Google and Google has sanctioned Iran. Mm -hmm. You basically can't use it. But if you turn on the VPN, like just sync up to this initial seed from there on you don't need vpn and you can use it and this is something interesting that people found mm -hmm. out there um yeah just like by passing sanctions based on just getting the right data <laughs> yeah <laughs> so um what's a um do you think people are now in, in Iran um, now are now really waking up to the reality of of you know of the of the uh, monetary properties of Bitcoin that, you know, maybe it's the time, this is the time now, you know, as you've maybe followed, you know, Bitcoin's yeah. price and, you know, and the whole financial chaos we are in and this whole money printing. Do you think people are now, you know, buying Bitcoin as a store of value or um, more? So 
it, it's interesting because I feel like in Iran that has been a thing for a few years now, mainly because of how real was devalued toward like global currencies, and people have seen this before. Like people that get familiar with the technology and don't consider this another like Ponzi scheme, <laughs> uh, they know this. But that people invest and like states are like now realizing that um, like having a, a constant supply is that what's such an important thing in a nature, natural, like nature of the currency. Because right now, like uh, the Federal Reserve, like just printed $700 billion and like that yeah. devalues every $1 that you hold, right? right. We'll see the short term, it's going to be crazy. Like no one can say, but long term, people would start to realize um, any promises based on the financial sector is not any promise. Like they can just change overnight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the circumvention of the dollar has already begun. I don't know who posted it. I think it was Max Kaiser, you know, from the Kaiser Report with Stacey yeah. Herbert, um, that uh, a number of countries have come together. I don't know what, what this organization or the, this forum is called. It's sort of a Asian something, you know, congregation where a lot of countries, you know, Russia, Iran, and China, and I don't know, and Kyrgyzstan, and a number of other countries, come together to, you know, find a way to circumvent this, the SWIFT system. So I think it's just a matter of time. And uh, do you think it's, it's, it will literally like uh, decouple uh, the dollar eventually, like in the next few years, and, and then eventually, you know, uh, uh, be a benefit to, you know, to the people of Iran, like prosperity and, you know, economical development? Um, yeah, I would say, uh, first of all, like, no one can predict what's happening these days because we haven't seen anything like this since 1918, which no one actually is still living since mm -hmm. then. Uh, but uh, even there, like the technology, the like transport, the commission, everything was different. So you can't really predict that. Some people might get lucky, <laughs> but like uh, I would say, yeah, like there is going to be a devalue of like the centralized currencies and even centralized governments because. Uh, one of the main reasons government exists is the safety and health of the citizens. And we're seeing that capitalism is coming in and like it's taking control a lot of times, which is really sad to see that how some people prefer to do a business deal now rather than caring about like the health of the citizens. Uh, so we are, we, are, we are going to see that, uh, how that affect that, I don't know, because there are some other counterintuitive uh, like things happening like let's say for privacy we're gonna have a different word after coronavirus because uh, now we're gonna have more surveillance systems because they need to track the people with the virus but it's gonna stay so we, we're going to have more tracking systems more surveillance systems less privacy but consider if that is open to people that might change the word for better or I still like I'm predicting but uh, if it's still under control of just central governments, that might even result in a more um, suppressed world that's to live mm -hmm. in. Um, yeah, that's an interesting thing to see. The other thing that I'm like really asking around is if cash, like the bills itself, they can contract virus and like transfer virus. Oh, that would not. be the perfect uh, excuse to ban cash now. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, but, but still like imagine if they ban cash and do a China style blockchain, which is like, it's transparent to the proof of authority, which is like central bank and everyone else is are just the users. That's a different thing. Cause now let's say transactions through the cash or other things, they're not monitored, but then everything would be monitored by one entity. Um, but on the other hand, if someone uses like a public blockchain for that case, you might, considering it's scalable by then, mm. um, it's a better system, but we'll see. Yeah. Mm. Where do you see, I mean, what, what is Bitcoin for you? When you, you know, when, when was the first time you, you know, you encountered Bitcoin or you, you learned about Bitcoin, you understood like the principles of Bitcoin? So the first time I heard and understood are like within a year of each other. <laughs> so the first time I heard about Bitcoin was around like early 2010, uh, which I even played around with the software. I think I even mined, but I had no clue what I'm doing. So I just closed the app and I it's just incredible. left it. And around a year after, um, I just started playing around with it and I, I'm coming from a security background and like mm -hmm. good hacker in one sense. Uh, and Bitcoin was like too good to be true. So I spent like around 
maybe a good six months just trying to debunk it. I said, like, there's something wrong with this. <laughs> and I remember there was this one night around like four in the morning that I started like reading five pages about Bitcoin. And then I realized, no, this is like, that was a bald moment. I was like, no, this is, this works. Whatever this is, like, I want to do this. And that's where actually I switched my master's from like Linux kernel security to like, full time on blockchain. So um, it was an interesting ride. Bitcoin was basically the first love <laughs> on like cryptocurrencies. Um, and right now I like work more on Ethereum stuff, mainly because there are more things to do. Um, it's more of the better playground right now. Uh, Bitcoin is this so concrete, solid thing that is out there, which uh, I still use Bitcoin. I don't consider like myself as a holder because or hodler because if you only hold it like why would you even want it like you know it's not just a speculative amount like you have to use it to see what that is and also like i consider people that have lost bitcoin real bitcoiners <laughs> uh-huh. like you have to lose some bitcoin to be able to like, know what that value is um yeah that's the short version of the last okay. seven years <laughs> is volatility uh would you say the volatility that is you know already now we're 11 years into bitcoin uh, and you know the speculation itself do you think it's part of the natural monetary evolution or you know to become uh you know from store of value to medium exchange to unit of account is that sort of a progression thing you see uh, because also of the absolute limited supply you know the absolute scarcity yeah for sure like all those has some effect on like even just get attracting people to bitcoin and it needs that like even uh, one of the first reasons Bitcoin became what it is now is for good or bad Silk Road, that people start to see, oh, there is this system like eBay, which is off everything else that we know of and we can actually use it. And um, that was where Bitcoin shines. And even people didn't know what Bitcoin is, they just need, knew that they want this drug and they need something called Bitcoin, um, which is like one of the reasons actually people saw the value in Bitcoin. And the speculation is also a part of every asset so mm. well i mean what, what is the essence of bitcoin for you is it like what is it what what does it represent for you what is it what's the essence of it Would... um so one thing is like especially growing up in iran there was like so many things that i wanted to do and i couldn't because of the place i live because of the government because something external to me mm. and initially bitcoin was this thing that had value and it was mine and no one could tell me that you can't use it or you can't take it with you. And it was like solely mine. Um, and it was like really dreamlike thing back then. Now it's like more obvious that as long as you hold the private key, you're the owner. Um, so like for me, it's the it's like scape or alternative to whatever we have right now in the financial system that if I don't believe in financial system right now, there is something I can go to. Like we didn't have this back then. Um, and the other thing is like, I, I do a lot of like global transactions. If I do like a project online with someone, I prefer cryptocurrencies because it's easier for me to do that rather than um, finding a platform we both use like PayPal and then like making sure we don't use the keyword Iran in the description because the transaction might get suspended. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, there are so many like things there that just doesn't make sense anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's about, again, uh, yeah, it comes, we talk about, again, the, the self-sovereignty, right? The censorship resistance, yeah. self-sovereignty. The, um, what do you think is possible with Bitcoin? I mean, when I think, you know, about like, whatever, it doesn't have to be Iran, but Venezuela. And I mean, once we reach, hopefully we, I mean, this is really my hope and wish once we reach that, um, the monetary root laying, as I would call it, or, you know, the critical adoption rate, what do you think is possible? with Bitcoin? I mean, it, also on an exponential level, like uh, socially, economically, uh, for the good of the people. Um, I, I really believe Lightning Network has a lot to do with um, more usage of Bitcoin, mainly because the scalability problems and there's always this trade-off between security and usability. So Lightning has less security than on-chain transactions. We all know that, but it's way more usable. Um, I started using Open Node, like I'm to just see how that works. Um, I know it's like non-custodian lightning network, but just the, the transaction was so smooth and I was like looking around to see where is the transaction? Like I got this money, but I can't really see it anywhere. And it was, it took me some time. I was like, okay, 
a Slightly network, so it doesn't have any transaction ID in that sense. Um, but it was so fast and smooth. I was like, okay, this is this this is good. Um, but I see that like Bitcoin would be using a lot of like federal reserves and national reserves, and possibly bank could be running lightning nodes for their users, and that would be the perfect scalable use of like um, Bitcoin in the national sense. Um, but also the other thing that Bitcoin has is like it doesn't consider borders as any limits. And mm-hmm. uh, that's one of the things I love about blockchain and Bitcoin in the sense that it doesn't matter if there is a border between us. Like we can just transact without any limitations or any even mm-hmm. conversions or conversion fees, you know, um, which it's more a global world than anything else. That's like one mm-hmm. of the best use cases I see. How do you how do you um, how do you explain to people around you? I mean, are people around you like your friends, your neighbors, or whatever, uh, or, or if uh, anybody who you interact with are they more critical now, more skeptical? I mean, less skeptical than than before, or how do you, how do you explain to people uh, like what Bitcoin is? Yeah, they are less skeptical than especially in 2012 when I was working on this. <laughs> um, even my supervisor, he was like, "There is no literature review on this. There is not that much work." I'm like that's exactly what I want to work on this. Um, and people were like looking at it as like gold quest or this Ponzi scheme. Mm -hmm. Now people know more about mainly because how long it's been around and still there. That's one of the main reasons. Um, but a lot of times like people ask about like details of mining and how Bitcoin works in like private key, uh, private key is something that people should know because we all learn about username and passwords in like eighties, nineties. And even then like that concept was weird. So the private key, if, we learn about private key, it wouldn't be that hard. Um, so when I want to explain, I basically ask, like, do you know how money works? Do you know how much money is being printed every day? And how, why is, does it have value? And people usually don't. So mm-hmm. I said, like, why would you like, want to know about Bitcoin other than the fact mm-hmm. it works? It has hey, most people, most people shy and real, literally think pe- uh, money is backed by gold. I mean, they're yeah, a exactly. huge service. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so when I consider it, when I ask it this way, like people start to realize, oh, they don't even know how the money that they have works. So, mm-hmm. so they don't really need to know. And that's, that's the case. Like as long as they know the best practices, how to secure their private key, or if there's services that custodian or non-custodian that can help them use their, their Bitcoin like safety, safely, um, that should be enough for them to use it. Like we shouldn't, we shouldn't con- like, consider like everyone should start learning about like ECDSA and like how private key works and like what signing is like that's infeasible to actually do but if you can put the services out there that people can use properly um I really like the open source movement of all the wallets before but the main problem was the profit models like there was before ICO times so there was wallets didn't have any best way to like make money and most of them died so that's why like BitPay or Coinbase, like all these other wallets are now the giants. But um, I remember like Mycelium was one of the favorite wallets I was using, but now they don't support sucks. Uh, but yeah, like putting more tools out there, like just people can use them or use it, like it, make it more usable for people. That would be. That's a very important that you, good that you brought out because I was just going to ask you, what do you think? Because I just, you know, had recently a talk, uh, my last interview with Rodolfo uh, Novak of Conkite, you know, makers of Open Dime and uh, what's a uh, cold card wallet and, you know, a bunch of other interviews with security experts and, and product developers. Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I'm really curious, like, because, I mean, I have experience. I mean, I can, you know, I can just say it. I have experience because I sort of tested, reviewed it for them a little bit. Uh, 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 the, I, I tested the, you know, I, I have experience with the Trezor one. Uh, and I'm not technical. I mean, you know, I always put myself into the shoes of the average user. And that's what I'm concerned about. Like, how easy is it? Because most people are like, like, when I, when I talk to them, it's like, oh, you know, people should just take the time and study it and learn it and educate themselves. But it's really not easy. I mean, I, I, I literally interact with them directly with these people and they have a hard time already with the Trezor one, you know, like, um, or the, uh, even the Bitbox. I mean, it's like more or less plug and play hardware wallets, but comparing it like to a cold card wallet, I've never tested it. Do you have like experience, like an overview, like how things could be more 
like um, make it more user friendly, UX, UI, uh, the ease of use. What's your take on that? Yeah, so uh, actually the first paper I did um, was called, um, yeah, a first look at usability of Bitcoin key management, which Trezor was just an idea there. It was all just coming out. So what we did there was like the same as you said, there's it's, it's, it's something called cognitive walkthrough, which you put yourself in a mindset of like a user that's the first time seeing it. And there are some, some aspects that like, is the app showing do you the state like, that is it connected or not? Is it synced or not? Do I know like how, where to click right now? Is there a chance that I click on something and I lose everything? <laughs> These kind of things. Um, it, that paper was really interesting for me. It opened up my eyes on like non-technical way of like looking at things. And there's this uh, last sector that we talk in that paper that we say some metaphors that we use are the reason people are confused. Like let's say sending coins. Mm -hmm. Like you are not sending coins. You're just signing, like transferring the ownership of a coin rather than, you know, yeah. it's really hard to say. Or even just saying coins, like people feel like if they're coins. Uh, but there is like a, a newer research on this. I don't think it's published, but I think very five from based on Montreal, they're like working on this on the usability of these things. And it's really hard. Like um, let's say, at first, there was this idea to abstract the very concept of the network, let's say mining fee. They abstracted it away, and then on the wallet, it was just like how much value you want to send, send, even like using US dollar value, like not even Bitcoin value. <clears throat> Sorry. But then and the network was congested, and people needed to like, increase the fees. And there was no way to increase the fees. So then we realized that like, we need this advanced tab to like, be able to like, change this. But then how far would you go, like replace by fee? Would you add that? Like that adds a lot of complication to the interface and, and the usability of the software. Um, so Bitcoin, if you want to fully use it, it is complicated and you have to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. But for normal user, we should, like the concept of like having the interface as simple and then advanced app that gives you the option is the perfect way of doing it. Uh, but uh, right now, Trezor, I would say like it came a long way from where it was before. Uh, it's still complicated mainly because it has a lot of more tokens that um, or coins that are not necessarily to be added. It's open source, so people can add it. Um, unless still, you know, unless you know, you know, uh, to put the uh, Bitcoin only firmware on it. Yeah, and and then uh, and then you know we should also not forget they did this whole analytic, uh, you know, this this super detailed analysis by the Kraken Laboratory or whatever it's called. Uh, where the physical access is really dangerous, like physical getting yeah. physical. Uh, once the physical access is there to the Trezor One, I'm not sure if they're all the, all the other models, but you can literally extract with a little bit of knowledge and high tech uh, the the seed phrase. So does a 25th uh, this 25th pass phrase would that help at all? No, or does it? Or does it doesn't you know make any difference? Yeah. So uh, I haven't really like I read the, the article, but I ha uh, there was a video I, I think. Um, I think that they say that that's the solution to like prevent this this specific attack, but uh, it's a cat and mouse game. Like there's probably going to be another attack on the other one. Uh, but one thing I want to mention here, just right before this, I totally forgot. Yeah, sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, yeah, like let's continue and like I'll remember. Yeah. I mean, do you have experience with all these uh, with all these other hard wallets like um, um, like? Do you, do you, what, for example, the Bitbox is, I mean, it's, 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 yeah. it's literally it works the same way, like, like Trezor one, except they have this microchip, uh, what do you call it? The, the SD card, um, that, you know, sort of as a backup. Um, mm. Yeah. So, um, the first thing I used was ledger, like the first ledger that actually I got from Bitcoin embassy in Montreal, mainly to review it. Um, it was a good thing back then, but then I used like Trezor. Um, I still use Trezor because that's one thing I feel comfortable with. Um, I have a keep key. I haven't really used it yet. Um, mainly like the one thing that works for you and it's secure enough, like physical access, like consider like it's a safe place. Um, it works for you then like that's a good enough thing to do unless there is something that is very different, um, like the touch ID or some other aspect that would change the game. Um, one thing I want to mention was, so we're talking about usability of these, but consider even the banking system. Mm -hmm. If you want to open a bank account, you have to go physically to the bank account bank 
sign a lot of contracts that you don't even know what they are. Like you might sell your soul in there <laughs> um, and you get this card and there's a whole, like onboarding is really complicated and concept com compared to Bitcoin. Onboarding Bitcoin is much easier, but we mm -hmm. don't have the mindset, like normal people don't have the mindset that this is an option. But for banks, we know that we have to go through a lot of signing, <laughs> which we won't even read the contracts, right? Yeah, so much foot footprints and, you know, like footnotes yeah. and, and, and small, like you don't even know, I mean, you have no choice other than to sign all this, you know. Yeah, and remember for Visa card, they had like the rates of interest and fees and there's like booklets, they gave it to you and they're like, here you go, you can now use this easy money. <laughs> So what do you think about running a full node? Should everybody, uh, I mean, finally we got our own, you know, our, our Casa uh, 2 and we had to pay, you know, additional um, customs fees, me and my uh, girlfriend each. Uh, and I set it up already, but, and it works. And now it works everything, you know, and I even got this multi-sig and, and, and the full node. And, but it wasn't easy because there was a lot of, you know, flaws and errors. It doesn't matter. But, and what I was going to say is that, uh, just recently, you know, I, I posted that in the Telegram group chat you know, of um, of Casa. I said, you know, what happens when, just in case, you know, what if theoretically, if if Casa, uh, you know, company or whatever, the whole thing goes bust. And I think James Lop was uh, directly, he answered to me, he's like, uh, you know, there's this, here's the link to the Casa, whatever recovery guide, the documents. And, um, and, and I'm like, oh, really, is that for the average person? Uh, because I read it through. I mean, it's, it's, I guess I could, I could figure it out. You know, I'm not, I'm not that stupid, you know, but I'm just putting myself into the, again, into the shoes of the average user. And he says, you know, and then he says like, it's like baking a cake, like, <laughs> like copy and paste. I'm like, no, it's not, you know, this is not like baking a cake. I know how to bake a cake. So I don't know what, what's your approach to that whole thing. It's like some people it's, uh, I mean, I really love, I love the work, you know, I've loved James Lopp, I, I had an interview with him. I love all these people. They're doing a great job. But it's sometimes I have a feeling they just don't understand what really people need, you know? Um, yeah, that's um, like that's the curse of knowledge. Like you get into the depth of uh, knowledge and you think that's common sense. Um, and that's where they are, especially like the social group that they hang out with. Like they're all like Bitcoiners and they know the technical aspects. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I know, I know exactly what you say, you're saying and, uh, feel you that it's really hard. Like, especially like if two years ago, I got interested in this field called STS, which is like society technology science, mm -hmm. which considers like more philosophical approach on like why technology and society, how they're intertwined and which one it's feeding oh, the other. Okay. It's really interesting. Uh, and I started reading that and a lot of papers are from like eighties and nineties, which we I feel like in the 80s, humanity was like asking good questions and then we got busy with MTV and internet. Um, and then people forgot to like ask proper questions. But it was fascinating that while, while I was reading them, when I was going to social science crowds, they, as soon as they learned that I'm an engineer, they would just not talk to me anymore. <laughs> and I, I would go to engineering faculty and talk about like, why are we doing what we're doing? And they're like, because we need this paper to be accepted in this conference. I'm like, no, why are we doing this? Um, so it was, I was feeling really lonely, even though I was in two worlds at the same time, which was fascinating. And now um, I feel more comfortable in like trying to explain things to people, but still there's this divide between even engineering and social science, which yeah. they complain about it, but they don't really want to do that much about it. Like they, they feel intimidated on like getting close to the other and they consider their knowledge common sense that like everyone should know. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, let me tell you something. I mean, um, I think there's very few people who are, let's say scientists, engineers, you know, coming from technology background. And I think, I mean, it sounds like a little bit, no, a little bit, uh, uh, maybe arrogant if I say, but amongst you and me, I think, I mean, my experience when I talk to Iranian, like people like who have, you know, a more uh, really specialized knowledge, whether it be doctors, medical, uh, scientists, technologists, I, it seems to me, maybe it's because of our, I don't know, mentality, culture or history, we are a little bit more uh, open-minded, like interdisciplinary. You know, I think it's so important to be interdisciplinary thinking and, and, and um, uh, 
and uh, interdisciplinary because um because let me let me uh, let me ask you because um, have you read the book uh the bitcoin standard by safida namus uh, yeah like not fully because um no problem yeah, you just, know yeah. and so on page uh, i think it's like 96 to 98 i've tried to you know talk to this to a lot of people about this so he talks about this uh you know he compares the the gold standard in the easy fiat standard money and what kind of technological innovations, you know, for Peter Thiel's expression, like zero to one, one to many. And uh, do you see this coming? Like, do you see this evolving that we're going to have more, uh, if, you know, our mindset is, uh, let's say more interdisciplinary, you know, more interflowing one another, and, and we have a really sound monetary system, which we can build upon. Um, do you think we're going to have more zero to one technological innovations that will radically like uh, uh, change the way we live? Like technologically, would it be transport systems or communication systems or, the, you know, socially? Is that something you think about sometimes? Uh, yeah, like it's, it's interesting. Like, so I read zero, and one, zero to one and it was one of the interesting uh, books. Um, and I was working on the Bitcoin ATM startup back then. And I was thinking of that book as more on the startup and like users that we want to gather. But now that you're mentioning it, I realized that in the last 10 years, Bitcoin has gone from zero to one. And now what aspects is there is like the hardest is zero to one and it's easy from one to a hundred. So um, I would say like Bitcoin as a whole, like blockchain has gone from zero to one and they have um, that one user or like 1,000 users that they want. And now it's much easier to get more mainstream from here. Yeah, that's an interesting way of thinking it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and you know, because uh, for me, Bitcoin, you know, is sort of the first condition that has to be fulfilled in order to, you know, evolve as a society, as a civilization. And this is what I often think about. I'm like, you know, is it, I mean, seriously, when we think about it, it becomes so grotesque, so, so, so hilariously grotesque is that for more than 100 years, we haven't really changed much. I mean, in a lot of sectors, like to transport, like we're still, you know, burning fuel, combustion engines, you know what I'm saying? Like in that, yeah. in that category, nothing's really changed, you know? Maybe, yeah, we have more modern planes and helicopters and all this and uh, rockets, and, <laughs> but on a, in a lot of other fields, you know, like uh, I think we have been really dampened down, like suppressed, like, you know, um, it's this whole system, you know, I think that, that stops. Yeah, I think there are like some wrong turns that we did there. Like um, I, a lot of times I'm, I don't consider myself like socialist or something, but a lot of as I criticize uh, capitalism because the way the wealth flow works. So um, like one example I want to use was like, let's say like just the oil companies prevent a lot of like technological advancement in the cars or the, the whole story about um, we had like, um, what's it called? Um, why my mind is like not working properly. But in 1920s, we had the option of both going with electric cars or combustion yeah. cars. Yeah. And the reason was like this caught up was more investment Ford and a lot of others that like pushed this forward. And now it's really hard to change that. Um, or the other thing about like um, that I consider really bad for humanity and society is a high frequency trading, which in some extent it was good for adding liquidity, but it pushed to a point that it gathers all the good data scientists, it gather, like, gets all the good physicians, like all the smart people out there are like, attracted to these companies just to make better algorithms, faster algorithms to just do million more transactions a second and make money, which at the end, Especially saying like, I give you money to do your business and I get it back two seconds, like half a second after I give it, like, you know, that doesn't add any value to economy or society in that sense. Uh, early on, the idea was like between markets, you could, you could uh, arbitrage and like make the fair market. But I don't think we are, like we passed that point a long time ago. Um, yeah, like those situations, like let's imagine all these people that would have got, um, absorbed in this whole high frequency trading world if they had more funds to work on their own subjects try to like make algorithms to make other aspects of life more efficient right um mm. that would have been a better investment uh, as mm. like society mm -hmm. so uh where do you see the next you know 
10, 15 years, uh, you know, evolving. Where, is, where, where, do, you, where do you see society, uh, you know, evolving? To be honest, into? with everything that is happening, I don't know what's happening in the next six months. Oh, yeah. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I so hope true. it's seasonal and in summer we can actually go around. Mm -hmm. But um, it's still like, it's an interesting and scary time. That it is, huh? yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, don't you um, think we are like really on a precipice, like on a, like on a, this is so, such a decisive moment, like which direction are we going to do? Are we going to finally separate money from the state, from the nation state, from government, from central banks? Is, isn't that the ultimate, like, you know, the, the power control structure? It's, it's so yeah. centralized. And now is the real, you know, the question, which way are we going? Are we going to, you know, more centralization or total decentralization, which we urgently need now, you know? Yeah, one of the things I used to say in the past couple of years that people were talking about, like what may, would make Bitcoin so like go mainstream, I was saying that the doomsday, <laughs> that like the thing that we have in essential way should fail, so this would come up as like the alternative rather than like we build a new alternative, and um, I kind of feel weird about that. That it is, ha it seems like it's happening. Um, that <laughs> I've been saying this, and I'm like, oh shit, we might be in the middle of it. Yeah, be careful um, what you wish for. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, I would say like we're gonna see a lot more of this coming in. Like maybe, so that's the kind of thing. Like maybe not the Bitcoin original view of like what considered decentral world, but somewhere in between, like some steps toward decentralization and removing tr unnecessary trust in a lot of sectors, um, but not fully decentral because we've seen that like. A monetary system that is working on a society should be able to be a bit flexible and be changed a bit mm -hmm. and not as strict as bitcoin not as loose as the monetary system we have right now so um somewhere in between would be the perfect place i don't know where that is yet how that would work but um for sure like bitcoin can be a good like digital gold for to back up a lot of those other technologies that would come in the middle right yeah you know we can learn a lot from the iranian history culture mentality or iranian people and their you know their their plight of you know their pain their suffering and i think out of necessity you know uh, you 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 generate sort of a, a sense of creativity and i think that's this uh, going back to iran is like i think the iranian people are really they can be if they had i think the real freedom to to do, and I do think they have sort of uh, evolved in the last whatever 30, 40 years, because I think uh, uh, I mean whatever we want to think about. It, I'm not a fan of this regime, to be honest with you. I mean, I'm not gonna make you know a secret out of it, but um, uh, you know this whole theocratic religious system. But uh, but I think the people, especially students, have been given sort of a freedom to think for themselves freely instead of I think it was even Khamenei who said. Allegedly, that's what I heard in a talk, in a speech to a lot of scientists and students and, in, uh, you know, uh, and researchers. He said, instead of copying others, let others, let, uh, you know, copy us. So I think they have somehow, you know, had more cre creative freedom to think, to research, to develop, to test, you know. And, you know, so we can only hope that this will, you know, be exponential in every field we can imagine. Yeah, one thing, um, so we were talking about this in yesterday, like two days ago podcast that right now, especially with everything that's happening and people are sitting home, the best thing to do is to find these collaborative tools that are online that you can use. So there's more collaboration within Iran and outside Iran that people yeah. can use. Like we talked about some like Trello, some other tools that they can use. Uh, hopefully they're not going to be filtered anytime soon. But um, so those tools that can now open up the social group that people work with and that could uh, easily like change the game change the dynamic of the game and people can be more free to talk about the things or do research have more resources available and we'll see how it goes but it might be good for some people that are actually interested in research mm -hmm. that uh, yeah. sit home and have access to this information yeah you're very true. You know, uh, Sean, um, the, the thing is, uh, I think there's going to be, uh, as you said, you know, the, we are really in uncharted territory. Um, <laughs> right? So um, I think there's going to be, you know, gradually, as they say, and then suddenly, like a huge demand, like a, a huge spike. It's going to be like on the trajectory 
also in demand for education, learning, you know, uh, hardware wallets, security, full node, like be a more self-sovereign citizen. So do you see yourself like also in an educational role um, uh, in the near future? Uh, yeah, like I've been uh, educating for a few years now, even like the first Bitcoin workshop in Iran in 2015, I did and I was there in Shaitesh okay. University. Uh, which like it was interesting that like it was to, toward like masters and you know, doctoral students of like cryptography and like, computer science but most questions at the end of the talk was about how to apply for Canadian universities um, <laughs> so it wasn't really directly about Bitcoin the video is online it's kind of interesting to watch to watch <laughs> that and mainly because I wanted to like debunk the mo Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme or is any gold quest style networking thing because I want to say like there's a technology behind this money it's not just <laughs> A digital money uh, but yeah like doing uh, so i've been involved with like coin iran like podcasts that she had podcasts like there are so many educational materials here in canada i do like teach and ta at like concordia university from time to time right now not like schools are closed but so um yeah like education is the main the reason like i basically i gave away most of the bitcoins early on just to teach mm. people how it works yeah. um so you're not the only one i heard so i, many I hope they kept their private keys so <laughs> yeah i just hope that god i don't want to know how many how many coins have been really lost you know in total i mean there's, a, there's, a, there's an estimate of three to four million it doesn't matter but um mm -hmm. it's it's crazy when you think about it so um, you know what, uh, Sean, let's, let's wrap it up, but uh, do you have any final, I mean, first of all, I want to really thank you, and I, I would really love to have you back like on a, in, a, in a form of a panel discussion, you know, with other Bitcoiners. Yeah, sure, future. that would be great. That would be great, you know, and because uh, sharing thoughts and, you know, and perspectives and experience, I think it's really, really important because uh, everybody, you know, you've got to pick up the people, as I always say, from different angles, you know, from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. yeah, Each exactly. one have a, have a different, is a, a, you know, they have different, intellectual emotional triggers so um and that's why all you know i i do this podcast to 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 somehow inspire and, and educate people uh, even though i'm not you know technical i'm not an economist but i i've read and i I've really you know like yourself gone down the real rabbit hole of bitcoin which is infinite you know yeah. like <laughs> yeah so uh, any final thoughts or people, any resources or links or, of yours that people can... Uh, can uh, yeah, can like, uh, so if, uh, so one of the things we tried to do in the last couple of years was like, to remove the language barrier that like people that um, don't know that much English, they want to know about this. So uh, there's this, this uh, Shir Yahat podcast. It's available on all the platforms. I would like to have you there if you want to talk Farsi. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, um, and like Coin Iran is like more news, like similar to Coindesk, but like, all Farsi. We tried to do like Ethereum.org is now in Farsi too. We translated that. Um, I think Bitcoin.org was Farsi too, but they removed that for some, like the new, dis the new design. Um, so translating software is like people can use it, their time. Like it's all really easy like it's open source as long as they find a json file with the strings that they can just translate that um i know like what i said now i just realized it might not be that easy but, um but yeah those are the resources the other thing is to do is do virtual calls as you said like panels or just discussions just talk about mm -hmm. read things and then try to just explain them to others because that's the best way to you learn too so um, yeah, that would say like that's the best thing to do right now. Just educate yeah. people and like and be what? more practical. Yeah, and you yeah, know, try exactly. there and you know have people really test. Yeah, we it's yeah interesting times, very interesting, it's exciting times we live in. So, Shai, thank you so much for your time, and uh, let's you know connect you. together uh, in the very near future, and hopefully yeah, for sure. Quickly. All right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> great. Bye. 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 Chai. So, what do you think about this? Awesome talk with Shine Skandari. I really enjoyed that talk because it's you know goes a little bit uh, beyond you know outside of the box and and thinking you know you know within the bigger picture of Bitcoin and and our society and, and, and technological innovations and evolution not only monetary but on every level we can think of. So yeah, I hope you loved it. Please like, subscribe, share, follow me, whatever you do. Thank you so much for support and for listening. Make sure you follow me and Cheyenne on, on Twitter and any other social media. Um, I would really appreciate a positive review on any podcast platform. And let me know if you 
have any questions, my email address is hello at the totalconnect.com. Looking for ethical Bitcoin sponsors for now so I can make more high quality content in audio and or video. And yeah, thanks so much for supporting and listening and I'll talk to you soon again. Bye. Thank you.